There we go. Happy Monday. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. It is great to see you. Great to see you. Monday again. They just keep coming. Thank God. But they just keep coming. It's just, I feel like every, every other day I'm saying happy Monday. It is a happy Monday today. The last day for me until the kids go back to school. Which you would think I, I would be elated to get that time back. And it makes me super sad because I love I love to be with them, and I also love not having the structure of a, of a schedule, you know. We'll see what happens. This is it. This is it. Let me see what buddies are here tuned in this morning. Robin, great to see you. Good morning in Wisconsin. It looks like you and Carol and Kaz had a great time. I guess it was this, this weekend doing some dyeing. Um, I was super jealous. I really wanted to come and be there. It looked like so much fun. You were making some beautiful pieces. Kaz, you're still off. That's great. Good morning from Muggy, Wisconsin. You don't have to go to work because of freshman orientation. That is perfect, isn't it? That is a great reason. <laughs> and you're dabbing at that. That is a great reason. Karen, great to see you in Black Forest, Colorado. Looking at more of the photos you sent today. I'm really enjoying the walk that we're taking through Sauter Village. I am really feeling like, <laughs> like I'm there in such a good way. Um, and it's making me more and more sort of um, galvanized to make sure that I get it all set well in advance next year. I tend to think about things at the last minute because I'm always slotting in um, teaching dates and other things that I'd like to do and impromptu things with the kids. And that's still a huge part of my life. Um, but next year, I really want to have that slated and on the, uh, on the calendar. I don't think I'm going to want to do vending at all, even if they ask again. Um, just because I, I guess I'm lazy now. It's just that's the way it, I'm not really lazy. I was up at 6.30 dying this morning, and it was, it was fun trying to think of what these next set of colors will be because I just did that kind of segment of the, the ones for this thing, those, um, the background Indian summer type colors still hanging on. And I was listening to the Frank Sinatra channel on my Pandora. I switched from Blossom Deary to Frank Sinatra. I got tired of female voices, and I thought, let's have, let's have some male voices now. But they tend to always play like the songs that you know really well and have heard so many times that it's like, give me some weird ones. Give me some offbeat ones. Give me some I haven't heard for five minutes. Um, but it was fun, and in the song Summer Breeze came up, and I thought, oh, that would be a nice idea for a swatch set. But then I thought, maybe it's too late, or I don't know. I'm still thinking about it, still thinking about it, but I'm determined that uh, for September, and I know it's coming up quick, I am going to put out another swatch set that will be certainly seasonal. I don't know if it's going to be full blast um, fall, but definitely lots of oranges, right, heading in there in those in-between colors. Um, and I am going to do, I'm going to start doing again the free vibitate pattern that goes with the swatch set. Over the summer, I just uh, took a break from the norm um, with work and stuff, too, because business is a lot slower. But we're going to get back into all of those things. So I hope that you have your seatbelt clicked, and I hope that you are ready to work on some dyeing with chemicals, with natural dyes, um, some new projects, some new techniques, because there is a lot happening in the back of my mind that is about to come forward and, and be shared. And I, I, I guess this is the time of the year that we're all excited for it, right? Kirsten, good morning. Great to see you. Thank you for reminding me. I'm always forgetting to say a huge thank you to Patreon members who support me, support this channel. Please consider joining Patreon. It is super, super appreciated. I will be putting out, I put out two free patterns yesterday with Patreon that are different than all of the others. And I try to um, write at least once a month, tell you what's going on, what I'm thinking about. I'm working on the current one now. So there will be a unique pattern that goes out at least one a month for Patreon members. And I appreciate your support. Um, I love doing this channel. I love um, reviewing books and looking at all the things we do and going places and bringing you news and content. Um, so I really appreciate the support you give. Thank you so much to Patreon members. The link should be in the description of this video, along with some of the new things I put out this weekend. It was a busy weekend for me. I got a lot done. I mean, it's kind of remarkable how much I got done. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just surprised. It's almost like a weird window opened up and, and gave me July back, the entire month of July. Uh, but I put out the Design Like Grandma Moses um, class, which is going to be super, super fun because whether you like Grandma Moses' style or not, there will be some very simple exercises. This one's going to work. I've been thinking about this one for a long time, and it's going to work a lot differently than past Design Likes because she was untrained um, completely. And, of course, she's famously um, known for beginning her career at this very accelerated age of 70-something. Um, and did really beautiful folk work that really struck a chord with people at that time. 
that was the time when, in terms of art, everything was very avant-garde. You know, the whole scene was just, for me, a little bit unpalatable, a little bit too much. So for people who didn't feel that way, seeing the work of Grandma Moses was like, whoa, a breath of fresh air. It brought you back to sort of nostalgia, to the old hometown, to uh, all that folk equality that is impossibly charming. So we're going to be looking at her work and looking at what she did to achieve the look um, of her paintings, right? Whether or not she did it on purpose is a different conversation, but we're looking at how she worked to get that end. Uh, the work of both Grandma Moses and another American artist who I really like, um, who's associated with, um, in Connecticut, New Canaan, the Historical Society, where I'm planning an event for the spring and also um, we'll be giving a talk and possibly a class in January, right? The, we said the saddest time of the year, let's do it then, give someone, give the people that are coming something to look forward to. But they house much of the work of uh, a woman called Augusta Simon, who's a little bit, starting about the same time as Grandma Moses, about the same age, lived in the same town in, I think it was New York, maybe it was Vermont, I think it was New York, um, that would be Hoosick Falls. Anyway, they crossed paths uh, at some point, and Augusta started painting as well as a much older person and did not as big of a body of work, but very interesting and very similar approach. And then looking at a third artist in this segment of Design Like, and that's Helen Bradley. She's a British artist, a little bit earlier, more 1900s into 1910s, who did the same kind of folky designs, but really captured England. Uh, English cities, right? Like all of the celebration, all of the festivals, the markets, um, the daily life, the high street, all of that. Very, very similar artists. In fact, if I were to put them in front of you, you probably wouldn't be able to tell them apart. And that's why it'll be super fun to look at them together in this class. I also posted the Halloween grab bag, um, the design for the trick-or-treat tapestry. And one other thing, but yeah, I'm probably not going to remember what it was. There's a lot of good things there that are new. Um, I'm trying to be as careful as I can to stay in front of the fall this year. Uh, Linda, great to see you. Carol, great to see you. Another Wisconsinite. You know, it's amazing how many Wisconsinites are hooking, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a good thing. It really is a good thing. Cheryl, great to see you. Linda H. in Massachusetts, great to see you. Shannon, great to see you. Happy Monday from the first state. Is that, is that, is that Delaware? Gosh, I ought to know what the first date is. Tell us, Shannon. I, I'm super ashamed, but I'm not quite sure. That's exciting, though. Doreen, great to see you. Kaz, great to see you. I already said hi to you, but I'm going to say hi again. I see you saying hi to everybody. Heidi, great to see you. I missed you. Courtney, good afternoon. Good to see you. And Jane, hello in Wales. Great to see you. Boris is looking fantastic. Fantastic. I can't wait till, you know, I'm thinking, when should we do another gallery night? Let's do it. Let's do it this coming Friday. Let's do it. So, yeah, let's do it. Um, I'm going to say we're going to do gallery night this coming Friday. I also want to remind you that tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, is our Zoom day. So Kirsten hosts that. I, I most likely will log on for that. Kids being at school and all, unless I'm crying, I will log on for that. So um, that's tomorrow, Kirsten, 11 to 1, right? And uh, Kirsten will put the login information onto our Facebook page, which is Row Cooking and Punch Needle Club. Kirsten, is it also possible to put it in this thread for people who are not um, on Facebook, just wondering? No pressure. Um, but that is coming up tomorrow as well. So uh, coffee time this week is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Back to our old routine. And Friday night is, cock is gallery night, cocktail night, gallery night. So make sure that you send me all of your images that you would like me to share. We will look at each other's work, what you're working on. Maybe you just did a sketch. I've got a lot of this going on right now. Can't reach anything. Yeah, maybe you've got a sketch going like this and, and you want to say like, listen, I want to do something with New York in it. Um, does anybody have any ideas? That's great too, because it's great to brainstorm in the thread on our gallery nights. That's Or if you started something or if you finished something ages ago, but you feel like, I don't know if this group of people has seen it, let's see it. Um, send anything you want for gallery night and then we'll project forward and shoot for bingo night the night the week after because um, our buddy Kira has been super busy lately and I noticed sadly that she just had an accident in the house the other day tripping over the dog gate and taking down her entire collection of uh, primitive pottery she said every single piece so um, 
that's devastating. I mean, that's like, I, I feel that when something like that happens and you lose some of your antique stuff. And one of the things was a bowl that her and her mother used to make brownies out of. I mean, it's just awful. So I don't want to tap her up for um, bingo this week. So we'll do gallery night this Friday night. and We'll do bingo next Friday night. Lots of things to look forward to. Beverly, good morning. Great to see you. Cindy, great to see you in Colorado. Wendy, great to see you. Wendy, where's my phone? I wanted to share. Oh, I'm going to have to. I'll get it in a minute. I, I want to share that um, email that you sent me because that was super uplifting. I'm going to do that at the beginning of the show. Nancy, great to see you. Really great to see you. Lorraine, hello. Good morning. Good to see you. And Gayla in Missouri, great to see you. Lynn, good morning. Agenia, April, lots of buddies on. Good. It's Delaware. It was in there somewhere, wasn't it? Let me just scale this. Hopefully the plug doesn't come undone. I just want to grab my phone. Uh, when, whoa, that was close. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, I got a long uh, dress on today. I thought, I don't know where a long dress and look nice, but it doesn't make any difference because you can't, you can't see the bottom of me anyway. Wendy, I got to pull up this thing that you sent me because remember last week on uh, Friday Night Cocktail Night, just a few days ago, we were talking about Sauter Village and how easy it is to uh, become overwhelmed when you see such good work. And not just Sauter Village, right? Like if you get Rug Cooking Magazine, if you get Celebration. I still do not have Celebration. Um, if anybody has No Man's Van, great to see you. Excellent. Excellent. Tell me how it is and tell me if there's anything unexpected, right? Um, I'm, I'm excited. It's coming today. Um, we were talking about, you know, also that little hiccup that I did in the Friday show where I just mentioned gallery stuff. That's really overwhelming. And that overwhelms me, too. The whole um, gallery thing in general is, for me, just not my world. And I was saying that there are so many rug hookers who are on that kind of trajectory. Um, I was more into that when I was much younger, 20, 30 years younger. But now I'm much more into the craft part of it. We're all into different angles of it. And it's so important to not look at other people's projects and go, oh, my God, I'm never going to, that's never going to be me. Because number one, that's just crazy talk and it's negative talk. And who needs that? Uh, you don't need that, right? You want to be positive and think about all the things you can do. So Wendy sent me something along those lines. Here it is um, that I thought was really good. She said, hi, I hope it's okay that I read this, Wendy. She said, hi, Diana. Sauter is not just for the cream of the crop for our craft. Anyone can enter their creation. We must spread the word for the next year. I found the following from the Rug Hooking Week director's homepage written before the event, and it said, um, RHW Rug Cooking Week 2022 main exhibit. Everyone is invited to exhibit their fiber art. Techniques include rug hooking, rug punching, braiding, felting, fusion. That's a, that's a new one, isn't it? We say fusion a lot with uh, like quilting, collage stuff, and also using interfacing. Um, but now we're saying fu fusion with hooking as well. Punch needle and wool applique. Pieces may be one or multi-dimensional exhibitors receive complimentary admission to the exhibit the vendors historic solder village oh that is nice isn't it all exhibit entries are eligible for the solder and people's choice awards see that is really good information um and that just reminds us you know and and wendy there is like a shout out right like there was in karen and everybody who went there is like is there a theme or you just submit um any of your work um, I'm wondering if they say, like, for example, this month of Atha farms, like if and then you're supposed to submit your farm work because it is good to plan in advance, certainly. And I bet they give you a big, big lead into this, too. But it's just a reminder to think about um, getting your stuff out there. Right. And a reminder that I'm st I'm working on my Van Gogh piece. No, I'm not. But I'm about to. That was just a lie. I cannot lie. Um, I'm about to, I hope. I'm not sure I am, actually. But I will have it done by the time of the exhibit. And I'm supposed to meet with the uh, library in Hartford, which is a large library. They have a big exhibit space, and they're excited to do um, a rug show. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exhibit the rugs that those of you who have sent me your Van Gogh rugs, I'm going to exhibit those. Uh, people who want to send me more Van Gogh chair stuff or any Van Gogh stuff, I would love to have that because I'll be doing a talk on rug hooking. Um, I'll be showing some of my pieces that have a Van Gogh bend to it. If you want to send a second piece, however you want to be involved, send me your pieces. I know there's at least one other person that would like to take the show once the shape of it is defined 
and show it in a different part of the country. So I will be in touch with everybody who has sent a rug to me to say, do you want your piece to travel to the next place? I will pack the pieces and I will, I will pay to ship them to the next place so that they move on and go somewhere else to a different part of the country where everybody can see them and take photographs and, and share them on Facebook and wherever else. I think it's w well worth the time and the expense of doing that. So let me know if you want any more information on that or if you want to jump on the bandwagon or that or if you're finishing up your pieces, just let me know. Dave, great to see you hot and humid again in Toronto, Toronto huh? Making a wooden frame for Van Gogh's chair. Awesome. Saw dust everywhere. Atmospheric, super atmospheric, like Van Gogh's own studio. Kaz says, can I send the photos of my Ultra Punch projects? Absolutely, absolutely, Kaz, I hope you do. You can send any kind of fiber art for gallery night. Punch is absolutely, uh, and your uh, piece came out beautifully, The Mermaids. Absolutely send that. Um, Lisa, great to see you. I'm told practice, 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 that's it. That's it. Whatever you're heading toward, practice on that one thing, right? That's it. Just like I'm, I'd like to practice at going to the gym, but I missed both classes this morning. But I'm going to I'm going to practice maybe going again uh, tomorrow. We'll see what happens. Oh, Wendy said there's a registration form uh, where you can say what category your rug fits into. So these are all things to think about. Right. This is exciting. It's good to plan ahead. It's good to plan for the short term, but it's also good to plan ahead. All good information. So. As we return to Sauter Village now, looking at some more photos, make sure that you jump in wherever you want, make comments, tell me what your favorite things are, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because I, I'm switching to our slideshow and we're looking at the last picture that we looked at on Friday night, cocktail night. And we really enjoyed this. I love the sort of pennant slash postage stamp trim here with a sort of rainbow graduated color happening. Really, really striking. And this is our first new piece of this of this series. Oh, Wendy says, check the Sauter Village Rug Hooking Week website. So there's probably already stuff on there projecting to the next year, right? That would be exciting. We can all sort of get a foot in there now. This is such a different piece. This is such a personal piece, isn't, isn't it? Um, if anyone at Sauter remembers this piece, please give a shout out. It starts, it's obviously a um, uh, storytelling journey of a life, right? It's like a, it's like a visual memoir starting in 1970 with a wedding. And that is a great wedding image. The multi-tiered cake. You hardly ever see those anymore, do you? And they're so exciting. They're so dynamic. Cats Gallery, good morning. Good to see you. And the little path leads you through antiques, through kind of, uh, well, Maine, um, a kind of Punch and Judy character, a chicken, maybe some farming. Oh, that's England. That's Big Ben, so I wonder if that is Punch of Punch and Judy uh, in a cottage. Ooh, this is exciting. Then it almost looks like Yellowstone Park. That looks like one of those paint pots in Yellowstone Park, doesn't it? And then the, like, you know, all the water features they have, the paint pots and the, um, obviously, geysers like Old Faithful and um, all kinds of stuff with smoke, all that agitated water and air right under the surface waiting to blow. That really looks like Yellowstone. Uh, but anyway, I'm following the journey that this rug takes, the hot air balloon. Gosh, the, uh, there's an amusement park reference back there. I hope that's not a bridge anyway. I hope that's an amusement park. Oh, it looks like one of the pyramids of Egypt 50 years later. What a beautiful rug. What a great story. And what a great composition. I mean, isn't this a great idea? 50 years. That is amazing. That is amazing. Gosh, I just love that. Um, I'm trying to make out what it says on top. Something of something. Gosh, I can't make it out. My, my image is quite small compared to yours, I think. But um, isn't this a great idea for a composition? If, you, if you're ever stuck for a composition and you're trying to do a storytelling piece, it is nice to do something like this. It has a bit of a board game quality, doesn't it? A bit of a Candyland quality. That was in the collection of rugs celebrating Maine hookers. Oh, okay. Because State of Maine is in there, so this hooker must have lived in Maine or lives in Maine now. Um, oh, how cool is that? I just noticed there's a lot of color change in the background, too. I was thinking it was a shadow, but it actually goes from light to dark, right? You notice the different grays. There's four sort of uh, ledges of, of different color going throughout diagonally. 1970. Okay, on the other side, Lisa, on the right side with that pink thing sticking up, I'm wondering what that is. I'm, I'm dying to figure that out. 
But what a beautiful rug. And, you know, if you think about it and you are feeling creative, to sit down with a blank piece of paper and sketch your journey this way, the highlights, your favorite things, you could make a really fun composition, couldn't you? You could really squiggle that line um, in any kind of configuration, right? Because I saw somebody working on one a couple of years ago, their own kind of storytelling line. I forget, it is one of our buddies who watches. Um, I'm gonna have to think on that because I haven't thought of it for a while and I haven't seen the I haven't seen the finished rug. But she was starting, it was a tall skinny rug and she was starting on the bottom with the beginning of the story like in childhood and it went up instead of kind of Candyland style. It went up to the present day and there were all kinds of things along the way like school years and um, uh, different festivals and different homes like that kind of thing and it was just a different configuration instead of doing something really squarely it just went up to done you know if you were gonna work on a piece like this and tell your story what a great idea nobody can tell you that you hooked it wrong or did it wrong it's your story in your composition so interesting I really love this piece this is the kind of piece that really grabs you doesn't it because you look at it you try to think of things that are similar uh, things that you maybe have in common. It's just a lot of, it's a lot of fun to try to relate to, oops, wait a minute, I hit the wrong button. No. It's fun to try to relate to a piece like this. Oh, that is very pretty too. There's a lot of rugs in this uh, exhibit with a lot of blues and yellows. And I think I posed this on Friday. I'm wondering if it's a coincidence or if it's just those are complementary colors and a lot of people go to them because they know in terms of color planning that those colors will pop 100% of the time. What a beautif beautiful atmospheric piece. This is so different, isn't it? You see a lot of skies, but not, uh, not many people are this brave with this time of night, um, this kind of darkening sky, right? The gathering darkness and that window of light that still shows, that illuminates those very busy waves. Those are very Japanese style woodcut waves, aren't those? Th those are 100% authentic waves. Those are very hard to do. That came out beautifully. The sky is just so beautiful because don't you wish it was every night that you're driving or you look out your window and there is this kind of a sky? It's, it's only once in a while you look out and you see this opening in the sky and you think, God, is that heaven? What is that? Is it a sign? You know, it's so colorful sometimes just like this. But it hardly ever happens. You wish it was every night, but it's not, at least not where I live. Really beautiful. And then the dark right above it. And I love those specks of light that the lighthouse cap is giving out into that gray part of the sky. It almost looks, um, atmosphere. I mean, it's atmospheric. It almost looks like uh, a weather, something weather related, like moisture, snow, rain kind of a thing. But I don't think it is. I think it's just the light catching the clouds and that contrast, you know, it, when it hits at this moment uh, of the night. I'm talking about the sky, but the way that the, the lighthouse itself with the little fence is built is so exciting. This is a beautiful shot. There's so much um, drama in this piece, partly because a, a rose parade. Oh my gosh. Hang on. I've just got to go back and check. Oh my gosh. That is so Oh God, I'm gonna have to pull that rug up a little bit closer. Yeah, I'm going crazy because I collect, one of my stupid collections is collecting um, programs like brochures from past, What what's the, um, something of the, ro the Tournament of the Roses, isn't it? Where they have all of those floats. I don't even know what state it is. I think it, is it Texas? I think um, they go way back, right? And I started collecting them because I'm obsessed with like, um, old department stores and old display stuff and old floats is right in that category for me. Super inspiring. I wish that there were more events nowadays where huge floats would roll by. I mean, don't you? Like, it, it's so much fun to stand there and watch these floats with people on them that have different stories, have different music playing. I mean, it's like, what's better than that? So that's really exciting. I, thank you for reading that. I love that touch. Every time I see those catalogs or I guess they're like the equivalent of a playbill, right? In an antique store, I always pick them up because I think it's so exciting to flip through and look at the past designs. And there is great inspiration for rug hooking or any creative project looking at those floats. The themes are so exciting. Um, and again, this piece has a lot of drama. I think not just because of the colors, and the colors are super dramatic, 
but also there is a little bit of danger. It makes me very uneasy to see this beautiful old lighthouse and this fence perched right up over the water. And the water's choppy and it's a peaceful night. Everything is fine, but at the same time, it is a bit tense, isn't it? it? Scenes like this always make me nervous thinking about disasters at sea and lighthouses. And of course, that is exactly where it needs to be to prevent another disaster. But it is dramatic seeing a building that is in, in obviously inhabited right next to the wild water like that. Oh, Carrie, great to see you in Florida. Introducing your channel to my friend Paula. Paula, great to see you. Happy times in Florida. I bet it's beautiful down there right now. I haven't been down there for ages. Oh, got to get back. Oh, how different is this? This is so different um, compared to what we've been talking about. You know, it was very often over the winter that we looked at pieces like this that were Rittermere pieces, McGowan pieces, and we always talked about how exciting a device it is when you use this kind of plant, right? The pine cones with these little pine branches, these very distinct little little stiff branches, these little sharp guys that get you, right? It makes such a beautiful pattern. It has almost a Japanese feel to it, right? Like a Genko kind of a feel to it. But it is it is very sort of New Englandy. I associate this with Maine strongly. I wonder if this was in the Maine exhibit as well. Really beautiful piece, very fine and filigree handling of the greenery here. And all of those pine cones, I'm assuming they're pine cones. It's so hard to do pine cones because it's that miniature scallop design. I like this handling of it because it gives you the sense that they are more than one color and that they are highly textured. And those highly textured cones against these soft fronds that are almost like feathers, so stylized, so light and wispy, so beautiful and seasonal and for me evocative of a certain part of the country. The background is exciting too. I can't see close enough. I got my good glasses on, I swear. I can't see close enough to tell if it's uh, patterned wool, textured wool, like a plaid or a herringbone kind of a thing. It seems to have a lot of movement in it. It could be just a mottled kind of a gray or a solid with a lot of directional hooking. But whatever that background is, it is really lifting the motif of the two branches. And it's done in a smart way. You, you wouldn't think with this color background that you would a be able to achieve this kind of contrast, but it really does work beautifully. And it's very atmospheric as well because it is, um, it's all fairly dark. The pine cones are popping. The pattern of the greenery is popping. It's surprising. If, if I were doing this piece, I don't think I would have had the nerve to get going with a dark gray color. Um, because I think I would have been worried about contrast with the green. Gray and like that, that country green color are very close together. Uh, the background is amazing, Lynn. It is a bit magic, isn't it? It's funny what you can do. It's funny what you get. And isn't it interesting that with our craft of rug making, it works so differently than other mediums, right? And that's why there are so many mediums, because there's so many ways um, you know, to, to express yourself cre creatively. But I was just saying to Kirsten in the car on the way over, I'm working on a Halloween piece. I'll show you. I think there's a moth in here, unless it's on the outside. It's not a, it's not a wool moth. But I still do not like to see those friends inside my studio. I was saying to Kirsten, I'm working on a Halloween piece that I'll show you probably tomorrow. And it's the one with the two, it's this one. And I added the two trick-or-treaters, but I've got it well underway. And I think I mentioned that I was doing my usual, you know, stupidity thing that I cannot, I cannot, it's a stop me before I kill again. I take out all of these patterned wools. In this case, I'm hooking with yarn and it's too many patterns, right? It's too many, it's like Halloween grab bag. I've got them all in one piece and I don't have a lot of solids to stabilize the design and keep some things really um, immovable. So this is what I do, right? I, I add all of these patterns and colors that I like and then I usually struggle because there's too much patterning and the whole thing is becoming obscured and unclear. And that is not what you want in any medium. You can have wild colors, your colors, but once it becomes um, confusing to look at, it really does lose its impact, doesn't it? That's something that it's very, very specific. So I was afraid that that would happen with this Halloween piece because I'm using so many patterned wools and it's just not happening. And it's one of the things like the background of these pine cones 
you just don't know why. It's, it, everything is a moving target, right? I'm probably using, I would say, at least 40 different wools for this, lots of small spaces. And with that collection of wools, they, they work independently the way that they are, just the way they are. But they also together have a different dynamic, that a group dynamic, right? They have a group mentality when they get together. The mob mentality, and it is creating, all that patterning is creating a lot of like st what looks like static on an old TV. And that static is reading, because it's all darker, as kind of haziness, like what you would expect to find if you were trick-or-treating on Halloween night, a night sky that was very hazy. So it happens to be working. And I don't know that I could, that recipe, it's not the recipe that works. Using a lot of patterned things is usually the recipe for disaster. But in this case, it's working. It's like that saying, even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? Once in a while, you do something and you know you're taking huge risks and breaking the rules, but it might turn out okay. And in this case, it is turning out today. I'll show you that tomorrow so you see what I mean. But my point is you don't always know what you're getting. You get what you get, you don't get upset. But sometimes you do get upset, don't you? And you start ripping things out. This is remarkable. I think I would have personally gone for, in the background, more like an aubergine plum kind of a palette because I would have felt more secure that it wasn't close to brown or that country green, which is a gray green. Or sometimes people say like a bluegrass green. Um, but this worked. I just wouldn't have had the nerve. This worked great, and it is a beautiful, beautiful piece. Let's see. And, ooh, a panel with a couple very different things. Oh, interesting. I wonder what the theme of this particular panel was. I wonder if anyone remembers. That is a very realistic, but also very artistically done cheetah on top. Look at all that wild patterning. Isn't that exciting? I'm only seeing it very, very small, but I do like the way that the spots kind of echo the spots behind the cheetah. I wonder if that's like a, uh, represents fabric or if it's just artistically framed out or some kind of a tent that is really wild. Uh, it might be just a pattern in nature, like a bush or something really beautiful. And below that looks like some kind of a strap hinge on an old barn. This to me is the, oh, Wendy says, Southern Pines designed by Pearl McGowan. That was, that was the pine one with the um, pine cones. Hooked by Cindy Fisher of Wa Wyomissing, Pennsylvania. That almost got me. Wyomissing, Pennsylvania. Uh, 47 by 69. Thank you so much, Wendy. That is a beautiful piece. Cindy Fisher, amazing. That was gorgeous. Um, the, the piece with the strap hinge here I am so in awe of pieces like this. This is the ultra realism. Really, really stunning. These, okay, I'm see, I can see that these are both Japanese makers. So maybe these are two pieces from Japan. These are remarkable. These are remarkable. Um, yeah, the, the realistic ones are super hard for me. I find them very hard to approach. It's just not my style, but I am in awe of this kind of detail. Um, the strap hinge, the color of the rust, just that at the atmosphere that is being projected, this kind of derelict building, with a lot of architectural interest, a lot of mystery behind a door that shut with an old lock on it. Uh, that game I sometimes talk about that I play with my friends and some of the kids, what's behind the door? When you walk in some weird place that you haven't been and there's a weird door, whether it's super fancy or it's something like that, and you play the game, what do you think's behind the door? And then you make up crazy stories about what could be behind the door. Um, this is one of those for me. This is absolutely stunning. These are, Karen says, these are by Japanese ladies representing the international hooking community. Well, it is being well represented in both cases. These are outstanding uh, pieces. Really, really different. Really well done. What a great exhibit. So much variety, huh? Two more beautiful pieces. I feel like we looked at these. Did we not look at these la on Friday night? Be I think we did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move by fast because I think we looked at these on Friday night because I remember thinking, God, again, these are incredible examples of light, right? L particularly light on water. It's very, very hard to do. It's hard to do in painting. It's hard to do in photography. It's very hard to do with wool. Um, these are extraordinary, but I think we saw these on Friday, so I'm going to move ahead quickly. Definitely watch Friday's episode if you haven't yet, because we were walking through Sauter Village together, some earlier slides from the same series, and really, really beautiful pieces, including those two. This one, this one is wow. This, this, is, my, this is my style. I love this stuff. 
it is the sort of Jacobian tree, the Elizabethan tree, um, taken to an extreme. We love to see animals in these trees, but I have not seen a piece like this. The Jacobian tree, yes, but so much more decoration coming out of the tree than we are used to seeing. Not just a couple of uh, buds and a couple of paisleys, but this is like getting to unicorn tapestry, epic proportions, isn't it? And in the middle, we've got the wise old owl. I love the way that the wise old owl is done. And a very active bunny. That is something that is usually absent from this genre of rugs, the Jacobian style. They're very stagnant, usually, just like a landscape would be. But this one is very active. Oh, let me come back here. Wendy's giving some info on the rust. Oop, wait a minute, this one? On the rust hinge, Wendy says, rust hinge is called These City Walls. These City Walls. Oh, okay, that's a U2 song, right? Yeah, that's definitely a U2 song. These City Walls designed and hooked by, oh, Val Flanagan. She's great. She was a Canadian artist, hooker and braider. She just was somewhere live this past weekend. I forget what part of Canada she lives, but I posted it in our Facebook group. And she said, I'm getting set up. Come on down. And I was so jealous because I'm dying to meet her and I'm dying to buy some of her original work. Um, so that is fantastic. Hooked by Val Flanagan. There we go. Colonia. Colonia. What a funny spelling of Colonia. That is cool. British Columbia. Excellent. Wendy, thank you so much. La Val Flanagan. Man, she's killing it, huh? The rusty, rusty, these city walls. Rust hinge is called these city walls. But... But she's not Japanese. I'm confused now. I'm confused. Hooked, designed by, design, is it designed and hooked by Val Flanagan? I'm so, I'm, Wendy, I know that you're right because I know you're looking at something in your hand. I'm confused because that, because it says Japan there. Maybe one, maybe some, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. No point in speculating, right? Um, exciting. To be continued. Nancy. I also love the owl in the tree. He has such a good look, doesn't he? He that Those big white rings around the eyes. I just love the shape of his little plump body. What a beautiful piece. You know, these Jacobian pieces, they tend to always use the same colors. This one is a little bit different. There is a blue cast to much of it, isn't there? A lot of blue flowers. Um, but also, if you look down below the bunny, and there's some kind of a bird down at the foot of the tree, they have a blue cast to them, unlike the owl in the tree. Um, which is interesting, very, very different. Um, interesting. And then there's a lot, the tree is filled with a lot of blue, but also a lot of orange rust and a little bit of rosy palette. Um, beautiful. And the background looks to me to be, instead of a stark white, more of a warm cream, like a vanilla cream or a French vanilla color. Um, interesting because that's a bit unexpected too with this color palette. The whole thing is unexpected. It's just wild. It's like taking the idea of doing a Jacobian style rug and really bringing it to an extreme. It has all of the energy, the excitement, the sort of, for people who love gardening and plants and berries, that, that all those boxes are checked. That interest is there in spades. But it's also got a, that medieval illumination quality to the bunny, to the owl, I guess to the animals in general. And the tree is a little bit different here because normally where we see these, for example, Pearl McGowan um, Jacobian and cruel work designs, the tree has a very almost, um, I don't want to say cookie cutter, I want to say like a more of a formula to the way that the trunk moves because the sweep of the trunk will only give you so many different scenarios in terms of possibilities for branches, right? So you have to be really thoughtful when you're sweeping. We did this in the designing like Pro McGowan class. You have to be really thoughtful when you're sweeping your trunk in different directions because you want to leave areas where... Um, Wendy says, Jacobian rug called Marty's Fantasy, designed by Marty, M-A-R-T-I, Rochford, R-O-T-C-H-F-O-R-D, and hooked by Tamsin McKeon, McKeon, McKeon. God, what's wrong with me today? Middle Haddam, Connecticut. Well, she's really near me. That's very near me. Great information. This is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. I love all the little touches because, again, it's so hard to plan that kind of a tree. If you're not working with a commercial design, you want to create tree trunk move movements. You don't want it to be the trunk in the middle, right? Because that doesn't come out looking like the Jacobian cruel patterns. You, If you want it to look authentic, you really need the trunk to one side. And then you need to think about the way you want the branches to swing. 
and then you're filling in all the different compartments that those branches have created, all the different cells that are inside the branches now, you have to populate those with animals, flowers, berries, things like that. It does have a formula. It's very easy to practice drawing this kind of a design, but I have not seen one done with this kind of a sweep. This is really dynamic. It's just an all around really um, high voltage piece. And, and it's such a traditional type of pattern that it's surprising. I absolutely love it. Marty's Fad Fantasy by Marty Rochford. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, so these are done by the sisters again. I, I, I'm not sure um, on Friday's episode if we got there with the name. The two sisters, they were featured in, I think, the last issue of Rug Hooking Magazine. And one of the sisters does the needle felting on the face, dry felting. And, and in other places I'm seeing here, I'm seeing some eggs in the background that are um, definitely needle felted. And the other sister does the hooking part. So I think we saw this one in Rug Hooking Magazine, and it was extremely... Was it Rug Hooking Magazine or was it Atha? I think it was Rug Hooking Magazine. It was absolutely extraordinary. I think I put a few, yep, this is a close-up. So you're seeing the contrast between, there's a lot of directional hooking here, but how are they able to get this super fine expression on the face with lots of detail? Well, that part is not hooked. That part is needle felted. And you can see the leaves, the kind of stalks behind the figure, um, also needle felted by the look of it. So interesting kind of, um, fusion between Lisa and Michelle, fantastic. Interesting fusion between these two mediums in one project. And yes, you can do them both on the same backing. Absolutely you can. This is a piece I hadn't seen yet. This is really sweet. Little girl with a really sweet, um, dreamy, eyes closed expression, a regular border. I'm seeing those upholstery tacks. That was really clever displaying. Um, beautiful color. I, you know, I'm not always one for a whip stitched edged myself, but this color is absolutely perfect for this piece. I love how wild, it's almost like static electricity in the hair. It really works with this uneven edge, doesn't it? This really odd border, very irregular, really works with the hair being in those, that crazy kind of formation. I love the old fashioned simpleness of the dress with the crazy hair, with the crazy border, and then some of the flowers are doing crazy things too. We're getting kind of 1960s style flower power flowers and chrysanthemums all curled under, very designy, very line driven, stylized flowers, right? Really beautiful piece. I might have more from Lisa and Michelle. Yep, yeah, this is one too. I think this was in the Rug Cooking Magazine, the two sisters together with the wild kind of Medusa hair, the shared hair, really beautiful and a kind of Hollywood Squares, Mondrian background. Very good stable background because there's a lot of color here and you really want the focus to be on the two faces, the two sisters, the heart in the middle. That is the story, isn't it? Beautiful background. That kind of a background maintains the energy, the pop, the pop culture look, the feel, right? All that energy, but it doesn't take away and it doesn't take your eye away from the picture of the two women um, because it's, it's a very uh, easy to look at background. It's a grid filled in with colors. Your eye looks at it and in a snap, it knows what we're looking at. I love it. I love to felt need to try this. You do know man's van. It is a lot of fun. Just remember when you approach needle felting, there's different kinds of needles. I'll just do this quick, right? Just in case more of you are thinking the same thing. There's two kinds of felting, the wet felting and the dry felting. And the wet felting, you need some kind of a washboard or something to agitate the felt, to make it thick, to rough it up and make it thick. When people do that, they are typically making the backing 100% felt backing, right? Mixed up lots of different colors and elements that you work into it, your wet felting. People typically use that as the background to do more felting onto. And what we're seeing mostly with rug cooking is dry felting. So you're not using the washboard, you're not doing it wet, you're not introducing soap and agitating. You have little kinds of, I happen to have this right here. Um, I'm working on a project, spoiler alert. You have little stuff like this, like roving like this. It's all, you can dye this roving at home. It's a lot of fun to dye, but it's nice and soft and you can pull off pieces, hook with it too, but you can also punch with this stuff. So when you're doing your needle felting, you're looking for a needle and they come in multiple sizes as well. I don't use the really fine ones unless I'm doing something very, very fine. I tend to use the mediums or the larges for speed. 
They also sell holders, like clover, if the brand sells holders, where you can put like five or six needles in at once. I don't use those because as soon as I start, it seems like it would be great for speed, and it is good for speed. But chance of one of those needles or two of those needles breaking immediately, 100%. Because all of those needles are in this one tool, and your hand is not going to press it 100% even each time. So different tips are taking more of the brunt of it. And as a result, the needles break left and right. That's the bad news. The good news is the needles are super inexpensive on Amazon or in your craft store. It's a fun thing to get into. You're going to be looking for what will get you started with needle felting to add to your, you can have a plain piece of wool for your background, a piece of plaid wool, any kind of a woven that it sticks to. Try felting, get a needle, get a, get a little bit of roving and see if it works. That's all you need. And then maybe get a couple of needles, get a couple different sizes and more colors of roving. Just find a backing, any kind of wool or even like a wool mix uh, will work the best and a piece of foam, like upholstery foam. If you have a pillow that's all molded up that has a foam center, take the center out and that's your backing because your needle is gonna keep going through it, right? But all you really need is the foam, one needle to start and a little bit of material and your backing. You don't need backing to felt, but when you don't have backing, you're doing three-dimensional felting. You know how people do little animals and things like that? They're not using backing. They're doing something three-dimensional. But if you want to hook onto backing, you have your backing down, or you have a wool works best, a piece of wool because it's a woven, and you just start going. And if it works, you've got a good formula. And for your next project, if you're wondering what works now, you just need to find another backing that it will work into. But roving will always needle felt onto wool. So that's always like a for sure. Anything else you need to experiment with and try, but it's a lot of fun to play with. And one of the great things about it is, for example, if you're doing a face and it goes a little bit wrong, you just take off a tiny bit, a tiny bit more of it and work it in there. Maybe pull some off, pry some off with the tip of your needle and try again. It's very forgiving. Right? You can keep going into it over and over and over. So it's not like, ah, look what I did. I screwed it up. It's not like that. It's just like rug hooking. You can, you can go in reverse a little bit, undo what you've done, and there are no repercussions. There's no consequences for backtracking a little bit to correct something. So yeah, absolutely, by all means, give it a shot because it's a lot of fun and it opens up a lot of possibilities for us as rug hookers, a lot more doors swing wide open when we look at different things that you can do. You can see what these sisters are doing, Lisa and Michelle, absolutely beautiful work. This is another one of their pieces. It looks here like the moon's face is felted, like the, the seated figure's face is felted. Uh, beautiful indoor scene, a little bit of a mid-century mod thing going on with the wall design, a couple of pets around. Looks like one of those egg chairs, very mid-century feel to it. A uh, little teapot, little piece of cake. Who doesn't want to sit down and, and uh, with a bunny on their lap, a coffee and a slice of cake. It looks like heaven, doesn't it? It looks a little bit like good night moon in the background, right, peeking in. Beautiful piece. I think this is another piece by Donna Harkman. I, I'm sure that it is because of the night that we covered Donna, Donna Harkman and we looked at her monochromatic and duochromatic rugs. This is duochromatic, purple and yellow. These are opposites on the color wheel. So that makes this a complementary color piece. And we know that that works. This works great. I remember uh, when we covered this piece uh, that she specifically was using the suffragette colors. She was trying to use a lot of suffragette um, symbolism in the Susan B. Anthony piece. And I know we talked about this for a long time, so I'm gonna go buy it, but it's remarkable that this was in the show. I would have loved to have seen some of Donna Harkman's pieces in person because she really is, talk about magic. What I was saying earlier about how sometimes things just come together. She, she does such technical magic. When I do magic, it's usually because my colors worked and I go, hooray for me, it worked. But Donna Harkman does such technical work that it's not really magic, it's planned magic. And it really, that's what magic is, isn't it? Uh, magicians, magicians aren't actually magic. They they know the rules and they're and they are making plans in the background. Beautiful pieces by Donna Harkman. This is a gorgeous piece, isn't this cute? This reminds me a little a little bit of like the artist Mary Englebright. Um, this kind of busyness, right? A nature scene that's a bit busy. Lots of lots of um, birds. Oh, you know what? This no. This more reminds me of. I wonder if it is a David um, Galshu. 
I wonder, just because of the busyness, right, I'm looking at that patterning, that border on the bottom, and getting into those flowers that at first glance I thought were sunflowers, but now I'm thinking they're David Galshu flowers. Um, this doesn't seem like one of his subjects to me, but it certainly seems like his kind of work and his kind of drawing. A very ornate birdhouse, but the flowers are giving, are giving it away. I think it must be him. The color changes in the different birds, really beautiful collection of birds. It, you know, it's, it's funny how that central bird, there are two birds who are in the center who, who get slightly lost, but I think that's part, there's actually three, I just saw the cardinal. I think that's part of the mystery and, and allure of this piece, that there are a lot of like colors, and it is a bit of Where's Waldo, in a playful way, in a whimsical way, in a masterful way, not in an oops, uh, I made a mistake way. The, see, there's a blue uh, bird, a blue jay, not a blue bird, against the birdhouse that is quite blue, and a red bird that's across, uh, next to the red band. It is almost like the birds are camouflaging with their environment. That's funny because that uh, robin, I don't think that's a robin redbreast, is it? With the, what's the bird with the white body with the black flecks with the red breast and the black wing? Gosh, that is that an oriole? Uh, I don't know my birds. I think that might be. But anyway, his little white body is quite near the white picket fence. So there is some kind of play going on, pulling the colors, peeling the colors off of things that are immediately next to them. That's interesting, isn't it? That's hard. That's that's taking the game to the next level. Um, that's extraordinary. If, if um, anybody comments on that piece, I'll flip back to it for a minute, and then we'll wrap it up soon. Oh, this is an interesting piece, isn't it? This looks like a great storytelling piece. Looks like a Boston Terrier with um, kind of a restoration hairstyle, one of these crazy hairstyles on top. Remember, we were talking about these hairstyles not that long ago. I think it must have been the David Galshu episode talking about the crazy hairstyles of the restoration period. This looks like one of them on this little dog. What a cutie. And it ends in a bird's nest, which is kind of funny because it seems to be just a collection of twigs and sticks and silliness. But then even if it is, um, a little robin has, has laid three little eggs in the top of it. So it, what looks like something very impractical has indeed become quite practical uh, and even necessary. That really is sweet. I like that little flourish on top too. That's a funny piece, very realistic, funny story, really, really different. And yeah, it is easy to get intimidated, isn't it? But it's not about that. I think more than being intimidating, it's overwhelming, isn't it? Um, because there's so much to look at, and each one of these pieces kicks up so much inspiration. Um, this It's kind of funny that I just said that, because this is a unicorn tapestry type piece. Remember, there's more than one unicorn tapestry. Sometimes we're talking about different ones. Um, this is more, I think, of a um, play on the unicorn in captivity, which is the one where the unicorn has the fence around him. I hate that theme, so I like to not see the fence here. Um, it's funny because I am currently working on another spoiler alert. I have not a unicorn piece, but I have a tapestry piece with a unicorn that plays on the unicorn tapestry. Um, and particularly because I've been trying to think of pieces to do because I know I have a lot of gardening friends out there who like pieces that have gardening crossover interest. So I've been working on this unicorn tapestry piece where the unicorn is not the central figure. There's a female rider on a horse and the unicorn is one of the characters, but the background is just like the unicorn tapestry. I'll be bringing this out in the next week or so. And all of the flowers are accounted for because I have, there's more than one book written about the flowers in the background of the unicorn tapestry. And you know, I'm not a gardener, but I still own t two books that are on this exact subject because when you open them, it's so interesting to read about what flowers are depicted, and there's arrows in the books that show you where the flowers are, but there are like thousands of flowers represented in the unicorn tapestry, and it is just cool to be able to look at it and like have, have this decoder of a book on my lap and say, oh, interesting, is that this and that this? It, it's all, I think, interesting. I love these epic tapestries, uh, you know, all this sort of European work. One of the unicorn tapestry series is in New York, so that's nice. Um, but there are a lot of European tapestries that are quite famous like this that you can draw so much inspiration from just looking at the position, right? This is a very magical looking unicorn. He doesn't look super old worldy. I lo he looks more kind of fantasy to me. I love the sort of goatee. Um, I love the tail, right? The tail has a very leafy look to it. I love the set of his jaw and his eye. He kind of looks like a wise old man, doesn't he? He looks like one of the witches um, in Brenda's piece, the fairy tale piece that we were looking at the other day. 
uh, when I went to Whispering Hill. And I love the horn, right? For me, this is like when we come to Halloween and you see lots of pieces and lots of references to like, you know, witchy things and spells like like grinding up a unicorn's horn kind of thing. I'm thinking this must be that kind of a horn. Of course, these are not real things, but just in lore. Uh, it's the right time of year to talk about these these funny things. But I just think this is a beautiful piece. It, it has that William Morris feel. It has that, you know, old, centuries old European tapestry feel. Um, it's beautifully done. It's incredibly well done. One of the tricks to the unicorn tapestry that is present here um, is we, we talked about this last week too with the busy piece with the two peacocks on Friday night. You have to go with the white background or dark background when you're working with this much busyness because you are using variations of every color, right? There is yellow, red, blue, green back there. There are browns, there are neutrals. If you, you would be hard pressed to choose a background color that did not pick up too much one of the colors that, that need to be here. Um, as part of the motif. So it's always tricky. But you really can't do the white background with the white unicorn. You could do an off-white, but then you are really at risk of the unicorn being lost, right? So tough choices, but working with a black background is, is always going to work. So that is a good, smart, and safe choice. One of the tricks of the unicorn tapestry and tapestries in general that are the size is placement of color. So when you look at, for example, the top, that blue bird. He's got kind of a woodpecker body, but he's got a long, a long blue body. He's kind of in a constellation of blue flowers and leaves, just a little bit, just a pocket. And then you move over to the fox and there are some yellow flowers around him that pick him up. Um, this is a device that is used in the unicorn tapestry and is used in a lot of tapestries this size, this age, because could I have just found you on Instagram? Um, Kirsten, Oh, I think that's between No Man's Van and Kirsten. That's interesting. How funny. Um, you know, when you do this kind of thing where you, where you have a motif like a bird or an animal and you populate around it with this kind of constellation of color, what it is in part is like echoes a weaving, right? Because if you weave, you know how when there's one color, if you were to look on the back, you'd see the pull, the other threads of that color are present, right? And there's more of them. There's kind of like a, the idea of a bleed of color. With the unicorn tapestries, if you're putting a little bluebird there and then there's a, flu, a few blue flowers around, around him, because the piece is so busy and one little guy in blue is going to have a hard time holding his own, it actually makes a lot of sense to put the things around him in a similar color because your eye then is not completely overwhelmed and bedazzled in a confusing way. It's looking and it's going, patches of color, I can handle that. Patch of blue, patch of the tiger lily color for the little fox, patch of the strawberry color. And you see these little patches and your eye can read that a lot better than just kaleidoscope, right? Particularly if it's not a massive piece, right? Like the unicorn tapestry is a massive piece. But for us as rug hookers, we are not often doing massive pieces. It is a good device with very busy pieces like this to try to create puzzle pieces or pockets of color um, so that your eye goes to that thing. And then you're smart enough to pick out the bird from the flowers. Then you're there. But at least it draws your eye to one color group and you're not just like, whoa, zing, 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 and completely overwhelmed and confused because the impact is sometimes too much. So interesting trick, that moth is on the outside. Yes, that makes me happy. And there's a bee out there too who wants to come in. Something sweet's going on in here, must be, right? All right, well, let's stop for today because it is time. Um, and we'll pick this up again on Wednesday. Wish me luck for tomorrow. The kid's going back to school. I know I'm going to be emotional and crazy, crazy basket case. But, um, or maybe not. Maybe it'll all seem good. They're super excited, so I don't want to let on that I'm um, stressed and sad. That's just another, another year, another grade, another turn on the hamster wheel. But um, anyway... Tuesday, tomorrow will be the chat, and I will. I am planning to log on to that, working on my piece for a little while while I sit and, um, and join in. And Kirsten is hosting that, and that will be tons of fun, as always. And then I will be back with you on Wednesday. In the meantime, don't forget to check out the new stuff on Ribbon Candy Hooking. A lot of seasonal stuff coming out, coming at you all at once. It's time. Um, and don't forget to send me your pieces for gallery night this coming Friday. Anything you want. Give us something to talk about. 
it is good enough. What you want to send, what you're thinking about thinking, I wonder if I should send it, you should send it. It is good enough. We are going to love it. It might be the thing that gives somebody their next great idea. And that's a gift, isn't it? So a good start for your kids. Oh, thank you, Heidi. I think they'll be fine. They'll, I hope they'll be fine. I said to Teddy this year, if that kid is in there who like punches him, I just can't have that happening again this year. I don't want to go crazy and talk crazy, but um, you know, the kids get bigger every year and the chance of doing damage um, permanent damage, like hurting somebody's eyes or something. I mean, it's just, I know I think crazy thoughts, but we're just not doing that this year. So I already, already have a little bit of this going, right? A little bit of Barbara Streisand, like the main event going. Um, I'm not going to say a word about it, but if he gets hit in the face tomorrow, this is going to be a bad day. Oh dear. Thank you so much. Hit the like button. Yes. Thank you. Like, subscribe, all of that. Share. Think about joining Patreon, all that good stuff. Have a great day tomorrow. Sorry about that. I thought my skirt was covering up my legs. Have a great day tomorrow. I will see you Wednesday. We are going to, we are going to stay at Sauter Village until we see all of the work that our friends sent us photographs of. I'm not going to squander those photographs by not looking at them together. Uh, it gives us all a um, prolonged and continued vacation, right? Have a great